യോഗേന ചിത്തസ് പദേന വാചാം മലം ശരീര വൈദികേന യോഗാക്രൂത്തം പ്രവരം മുനീനാം പതഞ്ജലിം പാഞ്ജലി രാണതൂസ്മി സ്തുവൈ പതഞ്ജലിം വ്യാസം ശങ്കരം ച മുനിത്രയം പത്രസൂത്ര ഭാഷ്യ പ്രമാദിവരണ I think we are discussing the 17th sutra of sadhana pada we are discussing how uh, the drashta drishyo ho samyogo heya hetu so what is the actual cause of all the problems that you are facing what are the problems you have to remember heya means dukha something to be got rid of for which we take to yoga for which we take to mysticism spiritual life meditation or whatever it is so that particular point should be kept in mind in fact that is the very significance of the first sutra atha yoga anushasana atha literally could be many things in vedantic tradition indian philosophical tradition atha could mean now onwards henceforth therefore and so on so there's a background a psychological background a spiritual background which prompts us to take to higher thinking to something transcendental and the background is a feeling of imperfection incompleteness which again can be felt only by a evolved mind somebody who has the culture the education the maturity of outlook would feel well i have all the money that i want i have big home a good job and all other wonderful things still there is something much more wonderful that i am looking for i should look for to justify our human identity so that feeling is rooted in the deep conviction well and the, the conviction that there is something wanting in completeness is called dukkha in buddhist tradition it is called heya in the yoga tradition it is called roga which means disease in ayurvedic tradition is a quadrangle chaturvyuha now here there is an interesting statement that comes from vyasa and other commentators so vyasa has got a statement drishyam ayaskanta manikal pasanniti matrena drishyatvena bhavadi purushasya swam drishi rupasya swaminaha see there is a reason why i am quoting all these strange words you know because they give you a clue to the original thinking you see you can speak a lot about what aristotle said but if you can quote one word from aristotle it makes a lot of difference so the ability to connect with that higher traditional wisdom coming from ancient sages it makes a lot of difference so here for example see the depth of thought and the psychological insight that we are so displays here he says the mind that's called chitta like a magnet so ayaskanta means magnet so ayaskanta mani is a small piece of magnet it's so like a magnet by its very proximity and objectivity because the magnet comes in close proximity and objectivity to a piece of iron like that the mind comes close in proximity and objectivity close to purusha and then what happens and the purusha is honor in the sense the real entity the self evident entity and it is of pure consciousness so what happens is 
This magnet attracts iron pieces and this helps the owner of the magnet in getting those iron pieces. So also the mind attracts some sense objects and helps Purusha in enjoying them. So Purusha, here remember Purusha is the self virgin entity. It connects with the objective world and it connects with the objective world through this strange magnitude, strange entity with magnetic power called the mind. Now, this is the real problem. And yoga is an attempt, or any spiritual tradition, any spiritual wisdom, is an attempt to de identify on the part of Purusha and attempt to de identify with the external world. And then we want to get back to our real home, real identity, that is Purusha. So our mind attracts whatever it can, comes in contact with. When I see something, we feel attracted. We may not get it, but the attraction creates a vritti, a tendency, an impression, and that will remain there. That is an important point, remember. It's not that we are going to get it, but the desire to get it is enough for the mind to be colored by that object. So a child who goes to an ice cream shop and the mother, and she, he asks the mother, let me have an ice cream. The mother says, well, it's not good for you. But the child cries and weeps and returns home that night he may see a dream, he's eating wonderful ice cream and his mother is feeding him ice cream. This for the child, but this happens to every human being. It may not be an ice cream for a grown up person, it may be something else. It may be desire of different types. So this is how mind gets colored. That's why we are assigned other commentators, we, uh, I mean, compares the mind to uh, and magnets. So this is what really causes this inherent incompleteness. The ability to feel this as a, as a state of imperfection, as a dukkha, as a state of incompleteness, comes to a highly evolved person and that person one day go to the library, or oh, enough of all this. Let me see what the Bible says, what the Bhagavad Gita says, or what any Dhammapada says, or any of the, any religious holy book says. He may go to a temple or a synagogue or a church and may discuss ideas, or he may at least take to music, higher music I'm talking about, or he may take to poetry, he may, just go one step beyond the empirical, the physical. That, that's, that happens when we are somehow uh, convinced of the basic inherent incompleteness of the objective world. That's why Buddha says, Trishna or desire is the mother of uh, birth, life and death, the triple levels of reincarnation, the past life, the present life, and the future life, all connected together by this dual link, Pradipti Samadpada, etc. And he devised the method, you should, uh, this, you should uh, first of all be convinced of the incompleteness, that is the Four Noble Truths related to Dukkha, and then take to Nirvana. And this is, of course, there's a different subject now. Now, this is the background for the next sutra, that is 18th sutra. We already discussed this earlier, but anyway, I can, because these sutras should be kept in mind, they are interrelated, that's why frequently a little repetition may not be altogether uh, without its use, you know, so to speak. Now coming to the 18th sutra. Uh, the 18th sutra is, Prakasha Kriya Stidishilam Bhudendriyatmakam Bhogapavargartham 
drishyam what is drishya what is the objective word it consists of all the senses of perception all the senses of action all that comes within the purview of human mind all when we interact with which again uh, can be analyzed uh, according to three gunas the four human temperaments sattva guna raja guna and tama guna this is the objective world that we have got in front of us which we consider to be uh, a state of imperfection so the basic idea this life that we are leading today with all these wonderful things around us with all the aspirations are necessary but there is a higher possibility there is a transcendental and higher possibility of life and existence there is a higher option this is not to be discarded that should be understood very often you know yoga uh, philosophy before the later uh, half of 19th century or rather before the last decade of 19th century historically speaking yoga philosophy was known somehow in some way or other in european countries and also in according to ancient history in, in places like alexandria in damascus in baghdad in all these places the yoga idea was quite prevalent so you can find the influence of yoga psychology in the writing in the teachings of thales the teachings of heraclitus in the te- even even uh, the, you can see the traces of this uh, uh, yoga idea in the in, in those the great teachings of uh, socrates aristotle and others and also uh, in, in the in the higher teachings of mysticism that were prevalent in alexandria and other places so anyway so the but the point is before vivekananda's exposition of patanjali yoga sutras historically the first real attempt to introduce yoga to western english speaking world before that yoga was more or less traditionally interpreted to be a life negating a, a world negating kind of asceticism that's mostly because yoga as practiced by mahayana buddhists and also jaina jaini jaina monks who were very who were extreme ascetics and also even hinayana buddhists were also adepts in yoga practices they practiced the some kinds of extreme forms of meditation based on yoga teachings so it was considered to be very close to the, uh, the ancient monastic idea meant for monastics so that was historically the cause for the idea that yoga is something life negating word negating then vivekananda gave a very very simple a common man's interpretation or introduction to yoga so after that in of course in succeeding the cage it became very popular so you find here uh, the external world and material world is analyzed uh, in order to present before you a higher option not to negate it not to deny its reality and not to discard it but to present before us a higher option so you can find here drishyam what is drishyam drishyam is what we see what becomes known what is experienced what is seen what is perceived that is that is objective phenomena and also uh, uh, our own mental intellectual feelings all can be called or can be categorized put under the umbrella term of drishyam mean what is seen the objective so what is the drishyam it is prakasha kriya sthiti shilam so prakasha and of the nature of illumination serenity 
knowledge, wisdom, that is Sattva Guna. And then Kriya, me, Kriya actually means action, the Joguna. So you can understand these characteristics only by observing persons, endure with these characteristics. If a person is very wise, intelligent, strong, but who knows how to use that strength, as mentioned yesterday, as power, but knows how to use that power. He is not used by power, he uses power. That ability to handle what we have got with maturity and wisdom, with knowledge and understanding, is characteristic of a person endured with Sattva Guna. At a Juguna, the person who is hyperactive, efficient, driven by a sense of ambition, not altogether devoid of wisdom, but they give his, his more emphasis to activity. That characteristic. So the Rajoguna cannot be completely devoid of some amount of Sattva Guna, but the but the, the predominance is given to the active temperament. That is called the Joguna. And Tamoguna, ignorance, inertia, confusion, restlessness, all can be called Tamoguna. So, Shiptam and Mudam, these two characteristics, according to the state of human mind, you know, Vrittis, a person who is restless because, not because he's active, he's totally confused. The other person is absolutely inert, inactive, because totally dumb. This state of mind or this temperament, inertia, ignorance, is called Tamogna. So there's three human temperaments. Now, what Yoga tells you is the objective experiences all can be analyzed and understood by uh, analyzing this the, according to these three temperaments. And yoga tells us all the evolutes of prakriti, including cosmic intelligence, mind, senses five elements and the subtle elements called Tanmatras, all are constituted or dominated by these three gunas, Sattva guna, Rejo guna and Tamo guna. So this objective experience of universe is, it consists of knowledge that it is Sattva guna, action, Rejo guna and a kind of stagnant inner condition Tamogana. And then it expresses itself in the forms of the objective phenomenal world, then the five senses of perception, the five senses of action, mind, and all this. And then one statement is the Bhogapa Vargartham Drishyam. That is the meaning. What is it? It is, it is meant for the enjoyment of uh, drashta. I mean, that's why, you know, I say bhoga, bhoga bhavagartham drishyam. So it is drashtuhu bhoga bhavagartham. That's the meaning. It is for the benefit. What it means is how do we um, identify our true nature with Drashta of Purusha by experiencing all this. And then by getting tired of all this. And then by detaching ourselves from all this through Pradip Prasava, by evolving further. So that's what happens when we are tired of this objective world, all the money, wealth, etc. Enough of this. A time comes, like it happened to Buddha, and he wanted to see some higher meaning in life. So, for this purpose only, the whole world is created. In other words, yoga tells you this world is in front of you, not for you to enjoy, but for you to transcend, but for you to go beyond. And when you go beyond, what happens? Then you understand that your true identity is beyond 
this objective world. So if a, if a person wants to eat a wonderful, delicious food, you make him eat it day and night, three times, four times. Then that will, oh, enough of all this. I want to have something else. There's no other way for the common person. If you tell an average person, oh, this world is not so good. Suppose you, you, you are a, a, somebody struggling to get a good job, maybe working in the finance or uh, in the Wall Street, let us say, make, trying to make money. Naturally, it's natural, normal for human beings. If you tell a person this money is not good for you, he will call you crazy. You can't tell that to a person. Sri Krishna says, You cannot go and directly tell the person, this is not good for you. But you watch for some time. The person, along with that, he also reads some higher books. He also practices some spiritual disciplines. And also he also engages himself, indulges himself in all these worldly enjoyments. Then one day, he will realize, enough of all this. I want something higher. But if you tell him at the beginning itself, it doesn't work, it will not work. So this objective world is there in front of us. It is needed. In fact, that is stated the most, more categorically in the 19th Sutra. This is a 19th Sutra, which I will discuss later. Tadartham eva drishasi atma. The, 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 you know, tadartham actually means it is for the drashta, for the purusha, that these external things exist. That means atma, he means the surupa. In other words, the world and all these objective experiences are there in front of us for us to go beyond. If we don't, if they, we don't have it in front of us, we won't. We won't strive hard. Actually, this is a this part of spiritual psychology. It's a fact. Human evolution. If somebody is a if a child is born, Lakshankara child, when he was a little child, he was he studied all the four Vedas by three years old, and by four six, by six year old, he became a monk, six, seven years old. What does it mean? Is some kind of a special human being? Not at all. In his previous life. He was convinced, oh, enough for this, or maybe several life cycles earlier. So next, if somebody like Ramana Mahushi, father passed away, and suddenly this man realizes. So this is the, this is all about human life. All this money, wealth, bank balance, everything went to disappear. The body also goes away. So this could happen to me also. So there should be some higher meaning behind it. So, all these experiences are there for you to go beyond, to help you to look at a higher level, to look beyond. That's the meaning, actually, we will discuss the subject. The next sutra will discuss that. Tadartham eva prishyasi atma. The different sutra actually deals with this subject. So, uh, in the 18th sutra, the, the, so the uh, I mean, the author tells us that this objective world, that means what is seen, that is in Vedanta we call Shabdas Parsa Rupa Rasa Gantha, all this, what we hear, what we touch, what we taste, what we see, what we smell, and also all the objects of other senses of actions. They are all meant for what? For the liberation of Purusha. May. Now remember, uh, where the Yoga Sutra tells us that there are as many Purushas as there are human beings. It's called Aneka Purusha Siddhanta, the doctrine of multiple Atma. So, that's why yoga is very, yoga is rooted in this kind of strong dualism, plurality of existence. So each soul, each jiva is its own Atman. I already mentioned during interaction, the last class. So one person 
because of his experiences and because of his conviction that I have to go beyond all this. He reaches that higher experience. Then he really identifies, well, I'm not just this body-mind complex that enjoys these external things. I have a higher identity. And once you practice your, the Ashtanga Yoga, I mean, yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, etc. Then one day you realize. In fact, if you study the psychological aspects of the first two disciplines, yama and niyama, you will understand these ten disciplines uh, themselves uh, will convince us of the reality of higher evolution. See, Ahimsa, Sati, Asteya, Brahmasari, Aparikriha, non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, pure life, non-receiving of guests, uh, gifts, non-receiving of gifts, that's called Aparikriha. Then, Saujya, Santosha, Tapaswadhyaya, Isha, Padithana, inner purity, internal purity, external purity, uh, contentment, practicing contentment, uh, then austerity, then reading and listening to holy words, feeding our mind with good spiritual food, and then resigning to God. If a, re, if a person really practices these 10 disciplines, or be the first one, Yama, are called universal. It's for every human being. It's not just for those who practice yoga. It's meant for every civilized human being, Yamas. And yamas actually automatically come to those who practice yama. Now, if you practice this, then but you can then you cannot really live like a child, even when you are a grown-up person. Because a child may go for ice cream, a grown-up person may strive to make millions of dollars. Practically, it's a difference in degrees, not in difference of kind. So then you actually will understand, well, contentment, let's say contentment. Real contentment comes when you're convinced that all these things are there for me, but I should look for something higher. And in fact, an attempt to look for something higher itself produces a great joy. And this is a very important principle in spiritual psychology. An attempt to practice a higher ideal is not because we are going to reach a higher ideal, but an attempt or the idea there is a higher ideal in front of you will help you to conserve and organize your skills and energy resources in a positive direction. The goal you may not attain in this life, but that should not pour cold water in our, in our mind. So a higher ideal you should have, not because you're fully convinced that this higher ideal is attainable in this life, but a higher ideal is necessary for us. Higher ideal is samadhi according to Ashtanga Yoga. I mean going beyond our, beyond Drishya, beyond objective world, and identifying our true identity with Purusha according to yoga tradition. It may take maybe if several more life cycles, but still, if we have got this higher ideal in front of our horizon, then that itself gives us a tremendous content. But that's, I can give an example. Uh, I have occasion to read some of the autobiographical writings of many Christian mystics, including the Russian Orthodox mystic like like Bear Pilgrim, and also centuries of Avilant, quite a few. Now, often if you wonder and if you observe, if you, con if you, if you think, how these great mystics who were given to praying, St. Peter of Alexandra, for example, a small, tiny monastery, supposed to be the smallest monastery in the world. He, he was a tall man, nearly more than six feet, but he lived in a tiny cell, less than four feet width and length, and that was a kind of austere life he lived. And he didn't sleep for long. How could they practice these great austerities? Or oh, the great ancient sages of India. 
if you go, if you today also you find, of course, the number may have gone down. Today also you find the Himalayas people who practice extreme kinds of austerities. Now, how are how is it humanly possible for them to do that? The real answer is they have a higher ideal in front of them. It may be. Uh, it may be this, it's the same spiritual goal in expressing different uh, languages in different religious traditions, different spiritual traditions, Christianity in one language, Judaism in another language, Hinduism in totally different language. But the higher ideal as such is common. It's a common property of these great spiritual seekers. The idea that this higher ideal is attainable and they are slowly moving towards the attainment of this higher ideal. That itself produces a great spiritual energy, which enables them to withstand uh, many difficulties. In the context, in the, in the history of Christian mystics, they, had to be, they were persecuted, they were, they were disowned by the mainstream church, they had to face a lot of obstacles, but still they, they withstood all this, and they continued uh, living holy lives. And of course, in Indian context, there were not there was no persecution, but they were all living in mountain forests, uh, hermitages surrounded by wild animals and wilder human beings frequently. Still, they could do that. So the reason, the point is, if you have a higher ideal in front of them, in front of us, that itself produces a spiritual energy. So now Swami Vivekananda's contribution was he presented yoga in front of mainstream society. This higher ideal is possible for everyone. For that, you need not go to a forest. You need not go to a monastery or a small cell. You can live light, uh, uh, right in this world, in the midst of your everyday duties and responsibilities. Still remember, there is a higher goal there is a higher spiritual identity that is used, that is attainable, and that requires only one simple condition. That is, you should be convinced that with, I have all this money, wealth, status, job, everything. Still, the, the, it's a state of imperfection. I should look for a higher goal. The striving for the higher goal. But that is the idea expressed in this uh, sutra prakasha kriya sthiti silam bhudendriyatmakam bhoga bhogavagartham it is for the it is, it is the experience of liberation abhavarga means liberation of purushas all these things are the for you to look beyond them that's the idea behind now we have to take the 19th sutra So that is a. So that that is, uh, the, the sutra is simple. Vishesha avishesha linga ma, linga matra lingani guna parvani. That is the meaning here. So there are certain words are here. One is vishesha avishesha, linga matra alingani. So. We will describe this, what is Vishesha, what is Avishesha, what is Linga Matra, and what is Alinka. The idea is, uh, the Prakriti or Pradhana is the, uh, is the material cause and also efficient cause of this universe. And this universe of multi multiplicity exists, or rather say plurality or intra differences, distinctions exist because of the combination of these three gunas, that is Sattva guna, Rajo guna, and Tamo guna. Now, Vishesha, Avishesha, means Vishesha means diversified. Avishesha means undiversified. 
linga matra it means an indicator only and that which is without any indication it is a linga these are technical terms so we need some explanation one is vishesha this particular division that is called the uh, diversified it means it includes the five gross elements the five gross elements is matter water principle fire principle air and space these are the gross elements which constitute this empirical universe it is part of the vishesha then then so it's a vishesha can also be called in you know, a particularized may be used and then the the subtle elements of shabda sparsha rupa rasa gantha that is what you hear what you see what you touch what you smell and what you taste these are the five different ways by which the senses of perception gets their knowledge by connecting with external world when the eyes connect with an object a visual object the mind gets the knowledge of that visual object because of the eyes when we taste something we get the knowledge of the particular thing that we eat with the help of the sense of taste so also there's then the sense of smell the sense of touch and the sense of hearing so all these that is jnana indriyas and karma indriyas and mind which are particularized modifications of asmita of course there is one point remember in those who read seriously yoga sutra and compare with this uh, with sankhya philosophy you find the mainstream sankhya philosophy if you ever read a book on sankhya philosophy you find the word ahankara is used because sankhya philosophy as we understand today is based on sankhya kariga uh, by the writer known as ishvara krishna in according to ishvara krishna all these external experiences objective world consist of evolutes of prakriti it all evolved from prakriti everything so what we see in front of us the pow mount the, the mountain the trees and the eyes by which we see those things and the mind that perceives and the intellect and also uh, the subtle elements of these five elements all these consist of 23 evolutes of prakriti it is the concept of india's evolutionary doctrine so purusha and prakriti two entities purusha doesn't cause any evolution prakriti from prakriti all the evolution begins the first evolution is mahatvatva cosmic intelligence then ahankara and from ahankara ahankara go three dimensions satvika rajasika and tamasika this is the sankhya view now if you read the yoga sutra books you don't find this ahankara mentioned instead of ahankara the word asmida is mentioned that's a term used by vyasa because vyasa was the person who made yoga sutras accessible to us without vyasa's exposition is the first of the major expositions yoga sutras would not have really had any meaning for the layman unless the study from a teacher in a traditional guru where these things are transmitted so in the sankhya context you find the word ahankara is used ahankara is broadly translated as egoity egoism and so on in the in english language so egoism has got a different meaning in literature 
So frequently they use the uh, rare term egoity. And Vyasa has used a much more technical and much more accurate, in fact, term is called Asmita. I mean, our own egoity. That's a better translation. So that should be kept in mind. You can find this difference. Though yoga philosophy has taken everything from Sankhya, these are, there are a few differences with the technical terms used. Now we'll come to the Turjit Sutra. Uh, the Tundit Sutra is uh, yeah, Drashta Vrishimatraka Shuddha Shuddha Abhi Pratyayana Pashyak. This is a Sutra. Drashta Vrishimatraka Shuddha Abhi Pratyayana Pashyak. Drashta. Drashta here means Purusha. The word Drashta is always used as to mean Purusha in the yoga system. And remember, in Swamiji's exposition, Swamiji frequently uses the word Atma or Atman. But that is perfectly understandable because Sankhya philosophy was a technical system of philosophy was not so much known uh, in the Western world before Swamiji. So, um, but in reality, Drashta can only be understood as Atman. Because the seer is a term when translated into English, it can sometimes be misleading. So the word Atma is a safer translation. That's Drashta. Drishimatra. Drishimatra means it is, uh, it is essentially of the nature of Jnana. And it is Shuddha, it is pure. The Purusha, Drashta, Atma is pure. Why? Because it, it doesn't it get involved in evolution. It remains the same. Atma, Purusha is the same. It is consciousness. It is ever effulgent. It is unchanging. It is multiple. It is plural. So remember the Aneka, Purusha, Drishtan, the Siddhanta. According to yoga philosophy, Sankhya philosophy, the same Purusha, that is as many Purushas as there are human beings. When one person uh, reaches his uh, real identification with his Purusha dimension, others also uh, may not have reached, others have to struggle in their own way. So this idea behind and they they uh, they have special reference for reverence and respect for those who have reached this um, uh, this purusha identity sometimes they're called gurus acharyas pragadilina purushas those who have reached this goal in the past so that is shuddha shuddha the word shuddha is pure the meaning is it doesn't undergo any evolution or change is no parinama story. Still, Pratyayana Pashya. But still, you know, that Purusha has to uh, use Buddhi. Buddhi, Kalichittam, are identical in this context. As we mentioned earlier, uh, Buddhi, Chitta works like a magnet. It attracts external things in the external world. And Purusha, the I connects with these external things uh, by being reflected in the buddhi and therefore purusha begins to identify itself uh, with these external things well in actual human psychology how it what operates i can explain when we forget and we often forget mostly we are in a forgetful mood when we forget our purusha identity then what happens our mind is called chittam. It uh, attracts external things. So when a person sees something attractive, because the person forgets his true Purusha identity, he identifies himself with the Prakriti. So he he 
connects with these external things and he begins to interpret himself i am the one seeing these things so like that i am happy now i mean happy this is my name at this job i am rich and poor aham dukhi aham sukhi you find sanskrit language is used one is painful one is pleasant and unpleasant like that we go on identifying ourselves with every single external experience our purpose is to reverse this how do we reverse this is called we use the word pratiprasava it leads to uh asampratyata samadhi which we are going to discuss in the samadhi bad so when we de identify when we detach ourselves with all these external experiences we reverse the process called you know re reverse evolution pratiprasa prasava means coming down taking birth descending the external world for the prasava means we are actually ascending and as we go on ascending we go on de identifying or detaching ourselves from these external things and then we realize our true identity we are purusha this is how it really works this desire to detach ourselves from these momentary impulses and experiences and look for a higher transcendental identity that comes to an evolved he old person we discuss this in the 15th sutra of sadhana pada tadi parinama tapa samskara dukhaihi guna vritti vishesha cha dukham eva sarvam vivekina viveki is a person a man of a person any human being of higher wisdom higher intellectual spiritual cultural maturity and when we reach this level of maturity then we develop a desire to look for some higher goal and that's how we actually begin our reverse evolution so now coming to the sutra now we will come to the 21st sutra that we already discussed earlier but uh, we can do that tadartha eva drishyasya atma drishyasya means prakriti prakriti means prakriti atma atma here means swarupa here atma means swarupa means true nature true dimension that's the idea atma here this in mean the atma atma is used in advaita text we should not mix up together so atma here means true nature so drishyasya atma means the true nature of this prakriti tadartheva it is only for drashta for purusha we already discussed this earlier in my early wisdom vyasa says the existence of prakriti is relevant only as long as it serves the purpose of purusha the whole world is for us to go beyond it to understand the possibility of higher options by going beyond what we see in the in front of us around us this idea behind purpose of the world is for us to go beyond it without this world we would not have thought of going beyond it this is all this idea can be found in the upanishads also janaka yatni vakya sambada we find here where that is the that we'll discuss later so if very frequently is many commentators Uh, discuss this and they they explain this sometimes in the light of one great statement in shankaracharya manushyuttam mumukshuttam mahapurusha samshaya 
three unique gifts from God. One is this privilege of being born as a human being. Then the higher and rarer privilege of having a spiritual ideal, mumukshuttum, the desire for liberation. And a third gift from God, call it nature or whatever it is, third privilege that people should look for is association with people who will remind you of this higher possibility. That is the greatest thing. So that's the greatest gift that a true friend can give you. A true friend can give us this possible option, can give this possible idea, this higher possibility in our life, the higher transcendental spiritual possibility, going beyond it, beyond the psychophysical dimension and to a, moving towards the spiritual dimension. That's why Durlabham uh, Trayamayavayadan that's why Shankaracharya begins here. Uh, so th these three Edatraya, I mean these three unique rare gifts Devanugraha Gaitukam that is it comes as a gift of the grace of God. Devanugraha Gaitukam means actually it happens by the uh, grace of God. That's what Shankaracharya puts in Vega Sudama. Manishyatvam being born as a human being and then being born as a human being with a spiritual aspiration for liberation and then uh, an opportunity to connect with, to associate with people whose association can gradually lead us to realizing this higher spiritual potential. So that is the idea behind, you know, here. I mean, the whole world is for us not to enjoy, nor to suffer, but to transcend, go beyond. That's the idea behind. Tadartham eva drishyasya atma. We'll discuss later. We'll continue this in the next class. Thank you. Namaskar. No, we can have interaction, most welcome. Maraj, a question from last time. Uh, it talked about the Purusha and Prakriti and also it's all individual jivas. Yeah. And uh, he, as you told in the 20th uh, Sutra, so individual jiva has to realize the purusha and that's the goal. Is there a, is there a role for collective consciousness? Oh, no, no. Yeah. no yoga and Sankhya won't accept this. This is, this is only in Advaita Vedanta. A fringe school of Advaita Vedanta, you know, Sarva Mukti Vada means the doctrine of uh, common multiple liberation. Sarva Mukti Vada. It's not that in Veda, in Yoga. Uh, yoga doesn't say that the whole society, you know, that, uh, every, every jiva has to work by reversing this evolution and gradually be able to identify with this transcendental Purusha dimension. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to get Apavarga. Apavarga means liberation. Okay, ma'am. No. Uh, Pranam Maharaj. Uh, the evolution from Prakriti is first uh, Mahat comes and then Ahankara. From Ahankara, Tanmatras come, and one of them is uh, the Akasha. I interpret it as uh, space. Uh, Swami Vivekananda says this whole uh, universe is uh, Desha Kala Nimitta. 
uh, if the akasha is interpreted as desha when is the time evolve evolving from this sequence where is the time what is this yeah you know time is not discussed the way we understand in these philosoph- philosophical systems you know time itself is something relative yoga and sankhya and also vedanta are discussing reality and existence existence not in relation to our earth in fact what you call time is really only an imagination time is never the same uh, you can we your, your time frequently depends on how you feel it if somebody pricks you with a needle every split second is very long and very painful but when you are seeing a uh, let us say a very wonderful drama or something long hours look like may sound like a few minutes so that's relative again uh, this earth moves rotates around its own axis and it moves around the sun uh, so our concept of time is based on a small tiny f- fragmentary interplay of the sun and one of its planets and there are innumerable stars and it is possible innumerable innumerable or infinite number we can't even imagine how many uh, stars and planets so how what we understand by time let's say uh, 60 seconds 60 minutes seven days one month a year maybe millions of billions of years that's again very very relative the time space and causation can also be explained in one way to describe prakriti and prakriti includes akasha prithvi apa tejo vayu akasha so uh, everything in this world including prakriti which is an empirical entity is within time and space and that's why it's called relative it is only relative so that time itself is relative and our empirical universe itself is bound by time and bound by space so swami ji was trying to explain this yoga ideal in the light of contemporary findings in physics and also in the context of vedanta because which was little more known so you find in many contexts swami ji uses the word for drashta swami ji sometimes uses the word atman because that term was more common it is the first introduction of yoga psychology and yoga philosophy actually sankhya philosophy to western world before that there is no real exposition of it so ishwar krishna sankhya kadi was already translated into german into some of the european languages even before swami ji in 18th century sankhya kadi was translated in german but uh, it never really it never really connected with with the reading people i said even in india today those who don't read vivekananda never really think of yoga as something serious they study yoga philosophy in, in colleges universities as one of the sub versions but you won't get any insight into this so anyway i'm not going to that so the point is coming back to your subject time is not so actively discussed because time is essentially the word kala is used but kala cannot be equated with what we normally understand by the english word time english word time is a very limited a uh, very uh, it is a it's much more limited in its scope than kala kala is sometimes used as the one that consumes empirical world kalo jagat bhaksha <laughs> time the kala is again translated by uh, translated to time the, the kala is interpreted as the one that consumes creation 
So re please remember, there's an idea behind. So I'm going to use the word time as, as a limiting factor, as one of the components of Maya, and one of the components of relativity. And the Prakriti and all the 23 evolutes are within time and space. Why? They're relative. They're not absolute. Thank you, Maharaj. Go ahead, Bobby. Ask your question. Thank you. Good evening, Maharaj. Oh, you both. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Is it, is it correct to think that in order for idealists to not misdirect their idealism, because after all, anyone can say, oh, I'm on the higher path. This is my goal. It's a, it's a worthy one. Is it, yes. correct to, is it correct to think that the yamas and niyamas are a prerequisite to make sure that yeah. one isn't falsely idealistic. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's true. That is true. So but yeah, you are right. on the I'm way sorry. articulating articulating some sort of ideal, yeah. knowing that you might yeah. you know need to check yourself. I mean you wouldn't want to be not idealistic and focus on function only through yama and niyama both work yeah. together yes yeah I, I was when i used the word ideal i i meant a spiritual idea and the spirit genuine spiritual ideal will be built upon the rock the bird rock of yamas and niyamas because if any person practices yamas and niyamas it prevents him from going in the opposite direction in the wrong direction, whatever ideal he will formulate in his mind, if he has got Yamas and Yama, that ideal will be for his own good and also for the good of everyone, for the good of the whole world. That's why the Yamas are considered to be universal spiritual disciplines. Sarva Bhauma is called it. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. So it is a universal spiritual ideal that is presented in the Yamas and Yamas. You are right. Any, any ideal to be an ideal, to be a genuine higher ideal should be uh, built upon these principles of Yamas and Yamas. The, um, the, the one interesting thing that you said earlier was about how Sankhya philosophy may have uh, dualistic elements, but but it's still a worthy subject for non-dualist uh, to examine for, for reasons of its uh, system, systemic approach to, um, to these issues of, of the mind and its control. And that seems like it's so often the case that we would review things that we would know to have faults to mine them for their qualities, even knowing that they are, were imperfect. So many things seem to be like that. Yeah. In fact, uh, all the, the Sankhyan explanation of mind, intellect, buddhis, five elements, all these are accepted in Vedanta, except the conclusion. They say in Indian philosophy, there is this method, methodology of Samana Siddhanta Vada, means uh, between two systems of philosophy, there could be two types of relationship. Uh, one system of philosophy may take, in general, many of the details of another system of philosophy, but won't accept the conclusions. That's the relationship between Sankhya and Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, the definition of mana, buddhi, mind, intellect, indriyas, senses, all as more or less identical in Vedanta and also in, in Sankhya and also Yoga. But the point is in both Sankhya and Yoga, uh, there are two fundamental eternal categories. So there is a very strong rigid dualism. Uh, that is what Vedanta is 
re reject. Uh, but the details of analysis of him and my daughters are truly accepted in Sankhya and Yoga philosophy and Vedanta. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from YouTube by Dr. Lula. Uh, I'll try to paraphrase this. Why should we be born as human beings and then have the desire for liberation and realize who we are? Yeah, yeah, that's again, you know, every person has his own or her own idea of liberation. Now, why should everyone strive for liberation? The desire for liberation may not come to everyone um, in one's life, but it is bound to come to everyone at some stage in our evolution. That's what Vedanta says. If we don't feel any need for liberation, if we are ready to live in this world and make a wonderful life in this world, Vedanta or yoga, no quarrel with that. Absolutely okay. You don't know naturally, perfectly okay. It, because we have not reached that level of evolution. So, um, in a way, everyone has his own or their own ideal, you know, but the same ideal cannot be thrust upon everyone. Why should we consider this world as imperfect, as incomplete? Well, why should we? Why should Buddha consider he was a prince, plenty of money, no work to do, everything wonderful? Why should he uh, walk a thousand miles, to 1,200, 300 miles and walk and sit under a tree and this uh, practicing the austerities? Absolutely. You have, well, but you ask him, he will give an explanation. Like that, those who have got this higher ideal of liberation, they have their own idea. But uh, everyone need not have at one stage. Yeah, you are right. There's no need. The, it is not mandatory that everyone should consider this world as imperfect or incomplete. Even in Vedanta, or in the Bhakti tradition, Vedanta Bhakti tradition, uh, with Vaishnava Bhakti tradition, you find this life is a boon. So can, I can take the name of God. So if I need Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings, the teachings of the great uh, devotional Acharyas of India, you find this life of God here gave me this life. And gave me a healthy body and healthy mind so that I can take your name, I can serve you, I can go to the temple, I can clean the place, I can do puja to you, I can worship you, I can meditate on you, I can read the Bhagavad You find such ideas in the Bhagavad Purana. They don't consider this world as something miserable, not at all. In just one view, you find in the Sankhya, especially yoga tradition. More than Sankhya Yoga tradition, you find, as we are discussing, it's not common in Hindu tradition. In Bhakti school, it is not very common. Yeah. Kundi, uh, one of the greatest characters in human literature. It's long, you know, she had gone, to, she had gone through every possible conceivable kind of misery and tragedy in her life, and her prayer to God. Give me a few more troubles because when I don't have a trouble or problem, I don't think of you. So I forget you. So give me more trouble so that I can never forget you. <laughs> give me more trouble so that I will remember you. So you, you cannot quarrel with a great person like Kunti. So she, can, she considered uh, difficulties as a boon because uh, it will make her think of God. So uh, that's our idea. Thank you. Good evening, Swamiji. Good evening. This Good is evening. Mark. Um, yeah, yeah. You talked tonight about um, yeah. Amkara and yeah. also uh, Asmita. The yeah. ego. Yeah. Um, my question is: um, Should we be wary of our ego? Uh, is the ego an enemy, or is it necessary to to have some sense of ego 
I know that Sri Ramakrishna talks about it in his teachings, um, uh, the eye and how, you know, you, we want to have the pure eye. Uh, but um, what is your take on, um, you know, this uh, concept of ego and how should we relate to ego? Yeah. yeah you know, in this particular context, when I use the word asvida used by Vyasa, and Ahangara as used by Ishara Krishna in the Sankhikari. There, uh, uh, the word Ahangara is used as one of the evolutes of Prakriti. But when you mentioned ego, I understand you mean by ego, the human uh, impulse, the human temperament. Well, according to mainstream spiritual teachers, ego is not altogether bad, not entirely bad. A healthy ego is a great help and uh, is a great source of strength and uh, help for our spiritual evolution. Even to have a higher ideal, if based on Yamas or Nehmas, Bobby mentioned, even to have a higher ideal and to stick to that ideal, we need ego. So ego can be a positive, it can have a positive aspect, positive dimension, it can be negative dimension. So an ego, a strong sense of idealism, strong sense of identity, confidence, and a sense of pride in doing something noble and good for others, for oneself. Uh, for that, we need a healthy ego. That's very important. One should never Try to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be egoistic, I don't want an ego. If you are sincere, this is a problem because our mind will go blank. A student who is working hard to get a higher grade in school, if you tell the student, no, you should not have an ego, his mind will go blank because he won't be able to set a goal in front of him to achieve something. So healthy ego is a great help. Ego becomes a problem only when it when it prevents us in developing a healthy relationship with others but a healthy ego need not necessarily create any problem in our interaction with others as i did healthy positive ego is a must actually you find surprisingly i mentioned these mystics they were very egoistic in a very positive sense. Hmm. They had to, they, they had to face persecutions. See the medieval time during medieval time, the Christian mystics. You think of Saint Teresa of Avila. Think of Saint John of Cross. Think of anybody you will find. They they never gave up. In spite of a lot of problems, they had to face. They have a they had a very healthy, strong ego. The ego actually took them towards God. Why? Because they had strong faith in God. God will protect them. They will realize the idea. See, look at Vivekananda. He was a man of tremendous self-confidence. He had to face a lot of difficulties in his life, but he had tremendous self-confidence. So, we should always remember this, this healthy, strong spiritual uh, feeling temperament uh, is not ego as we understand in normal human conversation. It is a positive asset for our spiritual life. So understand. you can um, have a strong ego and still realize the Atman. Well, when you actually evolve to a higher level, then you find you actually transcend the ego. When we start our spiritual life, a healthy ego will be a great help. But a strong, healthy ego, with which it makes, makes us confident, uh, gives us a sense of inner strength, to do spiritual disciplines, to do the right thing that we, as we understand it. When we do that, at some point, as part of our own evolution and spiritual growth, we'll find 
this ego has disappeared. That's what happens. A spiritual ego will eventually take you to a stage where you are totally devoid of ego completely. Your ego embraces the whole world. It ceases to be ego as we normally understand in human conversation. That's, that's the idea. So through spiritual practices, the ego gets purified. Purified, yeah. Purified, refined, purified. So it becomes sublime, sublimated. But at the beginning of a spiritual life, self-confidence, inner strength of conviction are most essential. They're very important. Yeah. To do anything noble, anything good, anything worthwhile in our life, we need a strong self-confidence, determination. That is, that is an expression of ego in its most positive aspects. Without that, no one can live and do anything either for himself or for others. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have no questions, um, we'll conclude. Thank you for the questions. Questions give me a chance to explain things more elaborately. I may have overlooked during my talk. So the questions actually give me an opportunity. Thank you. Namaskar. Om Shanti 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 Hadihi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Pranamastur